This video was sponsored by Rushing Spring. Stay tuned to check out Your Touch later in this video. What's up everybody, I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA. And today we're here to talk about Suicidal Tendencies, a band that has had a massively underappreciated impact on metal, punk, and really just like pop culture in general. They were one of, if maybe not the very first punk band to get played on MTV and expose millions and millions of people to the culture. They pioneered the fusion of metal and punk at a time when that was absolutely not popular. And their aesthetic influenced everybody from Limp Bizkit to Blink-182 to even the Kardashians and basically the entire streetwear scene. Their influence isn't entirely positive because they did bring an element of gang culture and hardcore that continues to be an issue today. But any way you want to look at it, the fact of the matter is, is that without suicidal tendencies, punk and metal just would not be what they are today. So how did suicidal tendencies become one of the most important bands in punk? And what exactly is their impact and legacy? Those are the questions that I will answer in this video. My introduction to Suicidal Tendencies and really to punk in general was when I saw them on MTV News back in 1990. They'd been banned from playing in L.A. for several years due to gang violence at their shows. Last week, after a record autographing session at Music Plus, an L.A. record store, the band played what was supposed to be an eight-song mini set in the store's parking lot. It was something of an event since the group hadn't been able to play a Los Angeles show for five years. I kind of said, I don't really know exactly what this is or what's going on here, but whatever it is, it's cool. And that was the beginning of my journey into punk and metal. But the band's origins go back way earlier than that. They started out in a neighborhood on the west side of L.A. called Venice. And to understand suicidal, you really have to understand Venice. These days, Venice is a very nice upscale neighborhood full of boutiques where you sort of expect people like Gwyneth Paltrow to shop. But back in the 70s and 80s, it was a very different place. They used to call it Ghetto by the Sea. It was really run down. The only people that were on Abbott Kinney were like, you know, the gangsters and perverts and my criminals. It was also home to the iconic Venice boardwalk full of weirdos and street vendors and musicians, as well as two of LA's oldest gangs, the Shoreline Crips, which was a black gang, and the Hispanic gang, Venice 13. And along with the neighboring city of Santa Monica, it was also the birthplace of modern skateboarding as seen in the documentary Dogtown and Z-Boys. And then they turned that into the feature film Lords of Dogtown. And Suicidal Tendencies founder Mike Mir's brother Jim Mir was actually a founding member of the Z-Boys skate team. Hello. It was a whole different trip back in those days. It was a lot more violent. You didn't have cell phones at 911 to call on people when they were attacking you. And so you put all of that together and it created this combination of like surfing and skateboarding and art and gang culture that was really the blueprint for suicidal tendencies and their version of punk that was completely different than what was happening in England or New York or for that matter, even in Hollywood or Orange County. And all of that was basically the raw ingredients for suicidal tendencies. After Mike Muir moved in with his older brother as a teenager, the band started playing parties in the backyard of their house and quickly built up a local following that turned into one of LA's earliest punk gangs, The Suicidals. As the Venice skateboarding legend Jay Adams described it, me and Mike Muir and a bunch of guys gave punk rock a bad name in LA during the fucking heaviest times. Being a gangbanger-like white boy hanging out with Mexicans trying to be like a lowrider. And that quickly earned them the title of biggest assholes in the Flipside Magazine Reader's Poll in 1982 and made it hard for them to book shows because promoters were, to be honest, understandably concerned about violence, but it also got them a lot of attention and notoriety for their wild shows and the violence that their fans would sometimes commit at places like Fender's Ballroom and Long Beach. A friend of mine told me about getting robbed by suicidals there back in the day, and from the sound of it, that was not exactly a rare thing. But in spite of all that notoriety, or maybe because of it, they eventually got signed to Frontier Records and released their self-titled album in 1983, which is best known for the song Institutionalized. I go bomb, just get it all I want the best and that was the very first punk video to get picked up by MTV back in the very early days of the channel when every single video felt special because the art form itself was relatively new. The song also ended up in the cult classic movie Repo Man. Oh, yeah, 
and on the back of all of that, the album became, as far as I'm aware, the best-selling punk album of that era, eventually moving over 250,000 copies, which was a huge number for an independent hardcore punk album. But to call that album simply punk, or really to define it just by the song Institutionalized, which was kind of an early version of a meme song, to me, that really does not do this album justice. I think Scott Ian from Anthrax put it perfectly when he included this album in his top 10 thrash albums of all time. I just think it's a perfect album. Every song on it is great. It's a perfect crossover between hardcore punk and metal, and I guess that's what makes it thrash metal. All those genres combined, and Suicidal were the first ones to do it because that record came out in 83. And as he pointed out, one of the defining things about it was how metal it actually was. And back in 1983, well, that just wasn't done. Punk and metal were sworn enemies back then. This was before my time, but you've probably heard lots of people tell stories about how if you showed up at a hardcore show with long hair, you might get your ass kicked. So for Suicidal to have this album full of like shreddy guitar solos was pretty unheard of at the time. And besides that, they were just like legitimately great, catchy songs. Like I Saw Your Mommy, Suicidal Failure, even a song like I Shot the Devil, which is like really raw, aggressive thrash, and yet somehow you can sing along to every line. Another thing that really stood out to me as a kid was their aesthetic. I didn't really know what to call their look with the bandanas and the flipped up hats and the flannel shirts. But of course, now I realize that that was just a punk version of the Cholo look. They just dressed like the gangsters they grew up around in Venice. I also remember spending hours staring at the photos of all the hand-drawn shirts on the cover, mostly done by a guy named Rick Clayton, and doing my best to copy every one of them. And it wasn't just me. The album made a huge impact on the punk scene, and it seemed like they had the potential to break out and maybe be something bigger. But the music industry seemed hesitant to deal with them, maybe because of their name, or maybe because of the rumors of them being affiliated with gangs. And to be fair, those rumors were probably probably not entirely wrong given the fact that they were always wearing blue bandanas and on the photo on the inside of the album the drummer is wearing a Venice 13 hat and that probably spooked a lot of the industry because remember this was a solid 10 years before gangster rap blew up and so the idea of musicians being in a gang at the time was really shocking weekends with Dr. Dre you in the club you partying the music is banging you're around hip hop he go to jail all that stuff we was just not doing nothing, so I was just mad that all the fun stopped and Dre had to go to jail till Monday. So I wrote Fuck the Police. But they eventually got picked up by Caroline Records and released their second album, Join the Army, in 1987, which was overall much less punk and more metal than their debut. <laughs> With that being said, they didn't completely walk away from punk, with the album's biggest single being Possessed to Skate, which pretty much sounds like it could have been off their first album. And I'll talk more about their connection to skateboarding later. You can even see that transition in their logo, which looks much more like something you would expect to see from a thrash band than a punk band. And with their next album, How Will I Laugh Tomorrow, on Epic Records in 1988, they'd fully completed their transition from a scrappy punk band to a major label metal band. Which brings me to the first point that I want to make about their impact and influence. Like I said before, in the 70s and 80s, my understanding is that punk and metal were pretty much bitter enemies. Metalheads looked at punk as like sloppy crap for losers who couldn't play their instruments. And punks looked at metal as kind of like lame and pretentious. But by the mid to late 80s, all of that changed with the crossover movement, which was essentially punk bands going metal. DRI coined the term with their 1987 album called Crossover, meaning the crossover from punk to metal, but other pivotal crossover bands would be SOD, Corrosion of Conformity, Chrome Eggs, Nuclear Assault, and Agnostic Front, among many, many others. I, 
I should also shout out a couple suicidal tendencies, affiliated bands like Beowulf, Excel, and No Mercy. And I'm not going to say that suicidal tendencies were necessarily the very first band to do it, and they certainly weren't the only ones. But as Scott Ian said, they were definitely among the first, and they were almost certainly more popular than anybody else doing it in 1983. So I think that they deserve a lot of credit for crossover. And that fusion of metal and punk is arguably one of the most important things to happen in the last 40 years of alternative music, because it led the groundwork for everything from Pantera to Converge to Kill Switch Engage and Avenge Sevenfold and pretty much everything after that. And they came back in 1989 with what many people consider to be their best album, Lights, Camera, Revolution, and the lead single, You Can't Bring Me Down, which is probably their most well-known song aside from Institutionalized. <laughs> And one thing you'll notice is that this album features their new bassist, Rob Trujillo, who, as we all know, would go on to play in Metallica just a few years later. Rob was also in Mike Mears' side project, Infectious Grooves, which had Brooks Wackerman on drums when he was something like 15 or 16 years old. Brooks went on to play in Bad Religion and Avenge Sevenfold. And I think that really says a lot about Mike Mears' ear for talent and the ability to recruit amazing players like them over the years, as well as guitarists like Rocky George or more recently Ben Wyman from Dillinger Escape Plan. And the band went through what I would consider to be their low period in the 90s, releasing The Art of Rebellion and Suicidal for Life before making somewhat of a comeback with 1999's Freedom, which helped a whole new generation of people discover the band through the song Psycho Vision on the Tony Hawk Pro Skater soundtrack. Which brings me to the big question, what is their lasting influence, legacy, and impact? And the answer to that goes way, way beyond just punk and metal. But let's start there. Remember how all the 2000s pop punk bands wore Dickies, Hurley shirts, and high socks, or how Fred Durst kind of dressed like that? Well, you can thank Suicidal Tendencies for that, and I'll explain how. The Dickie shorts and high socks were really the uniform of Hispanic gangsters, aka cholos, back in the 80s and 90s. And you might be asking yourself, how did bands like Simple Plan or Sum 41 from suburban Canada, or Fred Durst from Jacksonville, Florida, or Bullet For My Valentine from Wales of all places, how did they kind of end up adopting some of that cholo style? Well, the answer is very simple. They got it from Travis Barker, and Travis Barker got it from Suicidal Tendencies. But it really goes way beyond punk. They were a huge part of spreading that culture all over the planet. As Rick Clayton said, who did a lot of the artwork for Suicidal Tendencies and was also in the band No Mercy with Mike Muir, that look just ended up all over the fucking world. We grew up with that look. My uncles were in gangs and that's just the way they dressed. It's cool, I just don't know where these people in Japan get the clothes from. And what he's referring to there is that there's this whole subculture of like Japanese lowriders who are basically emulating that whole lifestyle. And I don't know that they got it directly from Suicidal Tendencies, but I do think they were a huge part of spreading that culture. They were also my personal gateway into the world of graffiti via their EP Controlled by Hatred, Feel Like Shit, Deja Vu, which, by the way, is my personal favorite suicidal release. The cover is a blue bandana with ST in the style of the classic Cholo block letters and with the song titles and liner notes all in some extremely crisp 80s Cholo writing. And I discovered this in the very early 90s when tagging and graffiti were getting really popular with skateboarders. And for the next 10 or 15 years, that was a huge part of my life. And again, they weren't the only people popularizing this art style. This was also when movies like Blood In, Blood Out, and later on Mi Vida Loca were kind of exposing people to Chicano culture and the Cholo lifestyle. But when it comes to the world of punk and skateboarding, they were 100%, without a doubt, the main conduit. And you can see bands from all over the world using that style now. People from like Russia and Germany, most of which probably have no idea where it even comes from. They just think it looks cool. And again, Blink-182 is probably the sort of missing link between Suicidal and these other bands, with the most notable example of that being how the background for the video for Down is all on that Cholo block letter style of graffiti. And even the Suicidals gang is actually still around. Oh, it's morphed a few times, and now it's an Asian crip set in Long Beach. You may have heard rappers like Stupid Young give a shout out to the Sueys. That's who he's talking about. Suicidal Town Crip is a gang from Long Beach, California, and is part of the SEA Alliance. SEA stands for Suicidal Town Crip, Exotic Family City Crip, and Asian Boys Crip. 
but I think their influence is even bigger than all of that. I think one of the biggest shifts in larger pop culture over the last few decades was the rise of streetwear in the 2010s, with Kanye West and by extension the Kardashians being kind of the most notable examples and vectors for that. And what is streetwear but the intersection of like skateboarding, punk, and you know hip hop or street culture? And I think you have to give Suicidal Tendencies a lot of credit for being one of the very first people to bring that very unique combination of culture into the world. Of course, along with early brands like Stussy, but like think about Kanye West iconic, I feel like Pablo shirt, which was pretty much directly copied from the Cholo Memorial shirts. You just have to ask yourself, would that shirt have happened without suicidal tendencies and their influence on pioneering streetwear brands like the hundreds or 10 deep? Would the graffiti artist Retina have a piece in Mohammed Hadid's house, the father of Gigi and Bella Hadid without them? Maybe, but maybe not. Either way, what we can definitely say is that music was never the same after Suicidal Tendencies, and the world in general wasn't either. And before I go, this is your check out Rushing Spring on Instagram and Spotify. There are links to both of those in the description of this video. All right, my friends, that does it for this video. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. Also, I wanna thank everyone who supports me on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the true cult level or above. Patrons get all my videos and podcasts a week early. There are VIP channels in my Discord that I'm super active in. I do giveaways. There's even a way to have me review your music. So if any of that sounds cool, hit the link in the description of this video. And with that, I'm gonna sign off for now, but I will see you next time.